Nice. All right, man. We Alrighty. are down to the last album, and it is a Matt Bio. Bad Paul, Brains. Paul Simon. Or Paul Simon, sorry. What Bad Brains. Did I'm, I'm <laughs> that last week. Eight. Let's do it again. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Paul Simon's Graceland and the opening montage you heard Graceland, and now you're going to hear You Can Call Me. So let me run some numbers here. So Graceland comes in at number 16 in the 1980s on Best Ever Albums, number 3 in 1986, number 126 of all time. It is Paul Simon's highest-rated album on best ever albums uh, it also was ranked in rolling stone coming crack in the top 50 at oh, number nice. 46 of all time and paul simon is ranked as the number 120th highest rated artist on best ever albums and um, this is his seventh studio album it was recorded from october of 1985 to june of 1986 and released on august 25th 1986 sold a ton of albums and estimated over 16 million copies worldwide it also won a grammy for album of the year and in 2006 was added to the national recording registry uh so along with um uh, run dmc two records tonight Matt, being is that, in the national that artist registry. ranking is that include simon and garfunkel or is that just i think it's different soul? no it's different okay I, I, I could look up Simon and Garfunkel later, but it's, yeah, it's different. Yeah, it's superfluous. I was just curious. Yep, that's different. So uh, this album had five singles, and uh, I will go over a little bit of the bio. So I th there's a quick bio at the very <laughs> beginning because uh, most of this was covered actually in the Simon and Garfunkel, but Paul Simon was born Paul Frederick Simon on August, October 13th, 1941 in Newark, New Jersey. Happy <laughs> New Jersey night, guys. Um, and uh, he grew up in Queens. His father, Lewis, was a college professor, bass player, and dance band leader, and his mother, Belle, was a school teacher. Uh, Paul Simon met Art Garfunkel at the age of 11, where they performed in a production together. Do you guys remember what, what play they performed in together as 11-year-old kids? Was it like an Ibsen play? No. Henrik Ibsen? No? Okay. <laughs> was it a remember. Brecht play? Okay. Uh, it is <laughs> Alice in Wonderland. I believe one of them oh, was wow. I think Paul Simon that was, was way off. Lewis Carroll. <laughs> yes. Oh no, Matt, you cut out. Uh oh, we lost Matt. He went into the, <laughs> into the down the looking glass. <laughs> Matt, <laughs> that's a out. perfect perfect literary illusion right there. Did I cut out? Yeah. Now you're back. Now you're oh, back. Yeah. Okay. What the hell? Okay. Keep so that I... in because it'll be funny. All I right, keep that a, in. Uh, I get to use <laughs> well, the Lewis Carroll saying, reference. All we heard was. The Alice in Wonderland, then you cut out. So. Oh, yeah. So the Alice in Wonderland. But if you want to catch any of the other bios uh, information from this period on, you could just go to season one, episodes 12, uh, 16, or 19, or episode two, epi uh, 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 season two, episode six. We did four Simon and Garfunkel albums complete with bios. Um, so I'm going to pick up in 1970 where... Uh, Simon uh, starts teaching songwriting at NYU, and then he decided to pursue some solo projects with occasional reunions with Art Garfunkel. He actually, if you guys remember, his first solo album was released before Simon and Garfunkel, which was the Paul Simon songbook. Oh, and um, when they started picking up traction, a lot of the songs from that they redid on um, their, I think it was Parsley Sage, Rosemary and Time. Um, so... So he does a second album in 1972 called Paul Simon, which we did cover in a cold listen hot take in in the 70s. All right. Anyway, so I guess I get cutting out, but anyway, we covered uh, we covered the Paul Simon's album for uh, second album in a cold listen season two episode three, I believe that was. Uh, and he also starts delving into world music with songs like the Mother and Child Reunion. Uh, his next album, 1973's There Goes Rhyme and Simon. Had the hit a Kodachrome, which you guys oh, might have heard like before. Yeah. Yep. And that was followed by Still Crazy After All These Years, which was released in October of 75. It was a darker record um, and uh, is his only album to hit number one on the Billboard charts, actually. Oh. Yeah. It also won Grammy of the Year, uh, Gra Grammy for Album of the Year and Best Male Pop Vocal. Um, is that the pop 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover album? Um. I, I am so. not sure. It's the Still Crazy After All These it Years is. album. Yes. It is. There okay. you go. Thank you, Josh. So the latter part of the 70s, he was less, less prolific. He didn't really do as many albums. He did write the music for the Warren Beatty film, Shampoo. And he also had a role in Woody Allen's Annie Hall. Had a hit in 1977 that was released on a Greatest Hits album called Slip Sliding Away. So I keep forgetting how many songs like, you know. Wait, that was a song had. specifically for the Greatest Hits? Yeah. wasn't oh, on wow. an album. That is a good song, too. Yep. Uh, in 1980, he released his fifth album, One Trick Pony. That was his... 
Oh, are you waving sorry. at me? No, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Josh was waving at me that I cut out again. <laughs> He's waving at something over there. I was there. saying hi to Emily and mistook uh, <laughs> it for the uh, emergency signal. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, boy. Uh, so his fifth album, One Trick Pony, that was his first with Warner Brothers, the major uh, music label. Do you happen that, to have that uh, album up where you can look at the cover? Because he's got a little... One Trick like, Pony? Soul. Yeah. Do you guys take a look at this album real quick before you go on? Well, he has does a movie called not, One Trick Pony too. I think. Does yes. he not on this cover somewhat look African-American on this cover? Like Soul Man style? Oh, so, de- his skin is definitely darker. <laughs> it's a little odd, isn't it? Like at yeah. first I thought it was a picture of someone else. And I was like, whoa. Because I was following <laughs> well, it to see what was what. It's like yeah. photoshopped kind of. Okay. But One Trick Pony was actually, um, it was uh, the, a film. It was the name of yeah. a film as well that he wrote and starred in. So It's supposed um, to be pretty good, actually, um, from what I've heard before. But I have not seen it. Yeah. Uh, so around this time in, 19, in 1981, September 19th, he and uh, Art Garfunkel performed at the historic concert in Central Park in front of what was estimated to be more than 500,000 people. So he's still riding that the coattails of the uh, the, the Simon and Garfunkel years. Does his that sixth was like al- the moment where like is that the moment where like baby boomers like officially like owned life right there? Like I feel like Simon and Garfunkel Central Park concert with that many is like is that the peak of baby boomers? Well, they got back like- together again to do another concert in Central Park this time with an estimated crowd of over 750,000. Maybe that's like, peak. So <laughs> that concert that maybe that's the Central Park one I'm thinking of that's the peak one. Okay, yeah. yeah. Well, he's but that was Go ahead, sorry. Uh, I was going to say but the the one from 81, well, I remember that was the album. I remember that album cover. That was that that sold a lot as well. So that was mm-hmm. it was it was pretty big for them at that time. Isn't he also kind of like a regular on SNL at this point too? Yes, yes. he's like and Lauren we're... Michael's favorite like artist ever. Yeah, okay. that Josh is setting me up nicely there. Oh, so that's nice. the here and here and we're going to start to delve into the story of Graceland, which I will have to say this might be the most controversial album that we've covered in our entire run here. There's all kinds of drama going on with Graceland. So, um, oh, so okay. yeah, so we're going to get into that. But uh, so he really releases his sixth album, Hearts and Bones, in 1983. Uh, did not sell too well. He at, around this time he married Carrie Fisher from yes. Star Wars, uh, Princess Leia. They they lasted only about a year. Uh, actually, and I learned this. It was Carrie Fisher's only marriage in her life. So um, uh, he was forty two when they got married. She was twenty seven. Okay, not too, uh, too bad, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> not, I'll remember not as bad that. As, <laughs> <not> as, <laughs> Uh, so, and then in January 1985, he was one of the contributing uh, artists to the USA for Africa's We Are the World. And here we go. So 1984. So yes, Josh, he was very good friends with Lorne Michaels. He had been on Saturday Night Live uh, a number of times, both as an uh, as a musician and a and an actor. Kind of funny too. I always liked the sketch where he did the uh, where is he playing basketball against Dr. J or something like that. And he's like, I think I can take him. He's like being interviewed and he's being all serious about being able to take him, but he's getting schooled. So, um, so he in 1984 he was introduced to a musician by the name of Heidi Berg uh, by Lorne Michaels. Uh, she, apparently Heidi Berg had played on the uh, in the SNL house band and also played in the whatever the show that Lorne Michaels went on to produce after Saturday Night Live. She was a guitarist in both of those house bands. Uh, she was looking to uh, per, you know create her own first a- album, and uh, she was trying to she was talking to Lorne Michaels about you know how to go about doing it, and he suggested she talk to Paul Simon. Maybe he could produce it. So she's talking to Paul Simon and she's kind of describing the sound that she wants with this record. And she was having a little bit of a hard time doing it. So basically she loaned him a bootleg tape of South African street music entitled Accordion Jive Volume 2. And um, eventually Simon got to listening to it and he fell in love with what he was hearing. Um, And he later told Rolling Stone, quote, it was very good summer music, happy music. It sounded like very early rock and roll to me, black, urban, mid 50s and roll like the great Atlantic tracks from that period and it became his favorite tape and he started singing harmonies and uh, and melodies on top of it 
and decided that he wanted to actually create his own record in, in this vein. Um, so he decides to go to South Africa and search out the artists that he's hearing on this mixtape. He asked Warner Brothers to find the artists that he was hearing, and they were able to confirm some of them through an African record producer by the name of Hilton Rosenthal. And some of the artists that he identified included Lady Smith Black Mambazo and the Boyoyo Boys, both of whom uh, appear on Graceland later on. So he goes to decides to go to Johannesburg, South Africa, uh, with his producer Roy Haley. And um, this was a very controversial decision, obviously because of the apartheid uh, government in South Africa. Uh, there was actually a ban by the United Nations uh, uh, prohibiting anyone from participating in any type of collaboration in the country of, of any kind. Mm -hmm. um, but Sim Paul Simon decides to go anyway. He actually talked to, while he was doing the USA for Africa recording, he was talking to Quincy Jones and Harry, Bel Harry Belafonte asking them their thoughts and both of them said you know <laughs> speaking for the entire uh black what, people you so, guys yeah. are you guys harry are belafonte Africans. give me the tools of the African well and the funny thing population. was is harry belafonte said yeah but you might want to check with uh who do you say he said that you should check with the so, african South national Africa. congress <laughs> yeah. you know and paul simon's like yeah i'm not going to do that so he just decided to go anyway who the fuck's <laughs> in that thing well, i should know yeah nelson mandela <laughs> yeah. Uh, paul i was left, better left implied there <laughs> so people who didn't know that answer could do some research. So yeah. Uh, so Lady remember Paul Queen went there and they took all that shit too. It's like they, they got sure like did. a million dollars for going. Yeah. So and I think that's well why Grand Parsons. By the way, I think that's why yeah. Grand Parsons left the birds too, or something like that. I remember that was part of the story too, or something that he decided not to, uh, not to because pursue they that. Went to the birds. Yeah. Went to South I think Africa? I think that's something like that. Yeah. Um, so Paul Simon later said, quote, I knew I would be criticized if I went, even though I wasn't going to record for the government or to perform for segregated audiences. I was following my musical instincts and wanting to work with people whose music I greatly admired. So uh, that's what he had to say about it. So he goes to South Africa for a couple weeks and he records uh, a number of kind of basically just jam sessions with a lot of these artists. Um, he did pay them quite well, though. He paid them uh, $200 an hour which was three times the going rate of what you what people were paying musicians in new york city and well above the going rate in south africa which was about 15 dollars an hour so you know in order yeah. to kind of like appease Offset. some critics he, he <laughs> yeah. paid these these uh these musicians quite well yeah. uh he also kind of saw some of the effects of apartheid while he was recording because i guess there was like a curfew that was imposed on on on, on black Af uh, south africans in South Africa at that time, basically. so when they were recording, they the artists kind of were getting uneasy because it was coming up to curfew, and if they didn't get back home in time, they could be arrested on the street or they couldn't use public transportation, things of that nature. So, um, uh, so that was happening as well. Uh, so some of these jam sessions, basically like ten to thirty minutes, and they would just lay down these tracks, and uh, Simon takes them back to uh, the United States, and he tries to figure some things out with them, but found it very tricky to, to replicate what they were doing. Um, a lot of the, 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 the time signatures and things like that were quite complicated. Uh, he did fly a number of the artists back to the States to record with him, as well as to England, where some of the recording was done for the record. And he also brings on some other artists, uh, including uh, Linda Ronstadt at the Everly Brothers and Los Lobos, who all perform on this record. Uh, he got even more flack for bringing Linda Ronstadt on because she apparently had performed in South Africa three years earlier for five <laughs> for five hundred grand. So, um, yeah, so that people didn't like that he brought her on there either. Um, so the lyrics came later on. Simon, some of them took quite some time to write, three to four months, because uh, he tended to use overcomplicated words in his lyrics, and he was really trying, he was finding it difficult to, to find the, the lyrics to put down here. Um, and uh, yeah, he continues to get flack for, for traveling to South really? Africa. Yeah, for sure. And um, at one point, um, when, once apartheid was abolished, uh, he agreed to perform in South Africa, but there were threats that were actually made to him at that time, including there was, a, I guess there was a bombing of an office of a promoter who booked Simon to play there. Thankfully, nobody was injured, but they totally destroyed the office. And uh, I guess he ended up trying to strike an agreement with a group called Azapo, which was a militant liberation and uh, movement and political party. Uh, I guess they weren't able to reach an agreement. And I guess at some point, the E Street band, Steve, uh, Miami Steve Van Zant, uh, met with the Zappo 
uh, and try to try to convince them that Paul Simon was actually not worth assassinating. <laughs> so uh, yeah, there were some people that wanted to kill that he was like at the top at the hit list well, there. So. Um... It's important to remember, it's kind of a little bit like what's going on with Saudi Arabia nowadays, right? Like in the sort of the idea of the sports washing, right, and yes. stuff. Mm -hmm. There was a real belief that how the South African regime was legitimized, right, was the idea that they were allowed to be part of the world, right? And so the yeah. idea is if you're, if you're going and playing concerts, right, that you would see in the West, right, you were adding legitimacy to it right yeah, and right, that right. was what the argument always was and so that's where it came from it's like you could say whatever you want about the sounds and stuff but like at the end of the day if paul simon right goes to do it to some degree the government can say well paul simon thinks it's okay to come here you know what i yep. mean and that was yeah. where the criticism came from yeah and anytime he, anytime it was brought up he was just like look man i didn't i just thought i liked the music and i just wanted to you know explore that area you know and he didn't really he didn't really think too much about that i guess but um so not only were there issues here with the uh obviously the apartheid and, and all that controversy yes which is still josh it's still a very much um uh, it's still kind of a heated thing there are people that are still very much angry at paul simon for this uh, it didn't just go away there's a lot of varying opinions on uh, his decision to to go there so uh los lobos were not happy with paul simon because there are allegations of plagiarism on this record as well. Um, they did not receive any writing credit for the last track, All Around the World, or The Myth of Fingerprints, which they played on. Saxophone player Steve Berlin recounted later that Paul Simon, uh, quote, quite literally, and in no way do I exaggerate when I say, he stole that song from us. Oh, we, go into the, we go into the studio and he had quite literally nothing. I mean, he had no ideas, no concepts, and said, well, let's just jam. Paul, so we jam, Paul goes, hey, what's that? We start playing what we have of it, and that is exactly what you hear on the record. The album sold 13 million copies, and we never got paid a penny for it, not even for the session recording. We bitched about this to the label's president nonstop and could not get a straight answer out of him regarding the song credit or session payment. Um, there's also allegations that there was some plagiarizing of another song on this, but um, I think it uh, I forget which song it was, but basically there was just they decided not to have any uh, legal uh, action put brought against him. So um, I guess when Paul Simon was 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 broached with the uh, with with the allegation of lack of song credit for Slow Slobos, <laughs> Simon told the guy, "Sue me, see what happens." Um, but later on, he denied that, saying that the uh, the album came out and then they they said nothing about it. And then six months later, they start, you know, Graceland became a hit. And the first thing I heard about the problem was when my manager got a lawyer's letter. So um, so yeah, so Slow Slobos not a fan of Paul Simon after this record. Uh, it was an album along with Talking Heads, Remain in Light, and Peter Gabriel So, which we're covering next week, I believe, mm -hmm. which uh, are credited as bringing pop uh, African rock uh, into the West and popularizing that over over stateside and actually worldwide. And advocates for Graceland feel that its music transcends the racial and cultural bar barriers of, of its production. Graceland was never just a collection of songs. After all, it was a bridge between cultures, genres, and continents, not to mention a global launching pad for the musicians who pop whose popularity had been suppressed under South Africa's white-run apartheid rule. That was a quote by Andrew Leahy of American Songwriter. So, um, pretty big album here. And I think, jo I got a quick postscript on Paul Simon here, but Josh, I think you're up with your take on Graceland. What'd you think? Yeah, um, I... I mean, despite all of that, and that's kind of a whole, that's a very interesting um, bio on this album. And um, I, I really dug this album. <laughs> like, I find I find his uh, use of this, you know, we talked about, I think we alluded to this before or something, but it's hard to now separate this sound from Paul Simon because I feel like it's, it's a, uh, associated with him and so many acts i.e vampire weekend have taken directly from from this style and the sound and it's now kind of evolved in some ways beyond this i think or or beyond at least you know the indestructible beats of soweto and kind of that initial influence with with the western artists and um it's not just you know i had not heard this album before i knew that kind of the big hits off of it um, you can call me out, obviously, and and um, <clears throat> diamonds on the solar shoes, boy on the bubble, etc. And um, it's not just African 
music though and that's kind of what i was thinking it was gonna be like a kind of a wholesale appropriation of of south africa you know like south african and then sticking paul simon on top of it it's not really that it's it, there's a lot of you know that's maybe half of the album i guess would be kind of those uh sounds and um tempo and some instruments and definitely the backing singers but it's also a lot of like zydeco and kind of that type of southern american style yeah i guess creole you know louisiana specific type of music and um and then just kind of the under you know the other the los lobos song i guess it is now and that's kind of different and that's more of like what los lobos was doing which was kind of like that chicano rock and roll and west you know east la type of um roots rock and the um you know the the linda ronsett duet is not really kind of an african song even though it's called under african skies so um i really like his incorporation of the different instruments on on the album you know there's accordion and a lot of zydeco type of instruments there's a tuba on boy in the bubble um, i really like the african um, backing vocals on i know what i know and um, we heard some uh, on homeless there's some vocal singing that's that with the tongue rolling and sounds they're definitely reminiscent of indestructible beat of soweto and um and you can call me al is just kind of like an indelible song and you know associated with florida gators where we were at one point so it's kind of tied to that in my memory and um i just kind of and the whole album is very um well constructed and kind of i enjoyed all of the songs there's not really a weak song on here and uh all of that kind of adds up to it being a a really solid album to me and i am able to separate it from all of that other kind of historical stuff i don't really have that association um to it even knowing that now Maybe I'll think of it differently, but I, f I find it a very listenable album and interesting. And his lyrics are always kind of a cut above, you know, even going back to the Simon and Garfunkel days. And that all makes it a really good album for me. So thumb thumbs up for me. Matt, I almost feel like you have to go second because the angle I'm going to take is going to be like a full stop <laughs> angle, I think. So, like, I, I kind of want to, before I go, the, He's gonna no, it's, it's too, it's impossible. It's too, I don't, like, it's going to take it. Like, so I need Matt to go second, I guess is <laughs> okay. what I'm saying. Because I, it will, it will just basically Whoa, what eat a up prelude. space, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's not surprising. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, um, I didn't know. I knew some of the songs on this. I didn't know this album. Um, I think I knew The Boy in the Bubble. That sounded familiar. Graceland was familiar. Diamonds on the Soles of Her Shoes and You Can Call Me Al. I think those are pretty much the maybe the singles yeah, the too. So, um, so yeah, I think I, I, I had a similar reaction, Josh. I thought that this was, after doing the research, I'm like, I'm hearing all the, you know, the, uh, really into the, the, so, the, the, the South African music. And, you know, after doing the indestructible beat of Soweto that we did several weeks ago, I was getting... I, I was surprised about how different some of this was from that. Um, mm -hmm. It's like a Zydeco. That was another, that was a word that kind of came up as well. Yeah. It's like, you know, you a lot of accordion and like, yeah, you kind of, it's not necessarily like the swampy nature sound of that stuff, but it's, it's a very upbeat. It's a very happy kind of, 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 of sound. And that makes sense after hearing that one of the things that Paul Simon was so attracted to with this was, um, was how upbeat, uh, upbeat and happy sounding the, the music was. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a, it was a pretty easy listen. I didn't think, um, I, 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 I wasn't put off by anything. I think, um, some of it I, I really like I loved listening to Di like a song like Diamonds on the Soles of Her Shoes which I, I forgot about like I knew the chorus like in the back of my mind but there were like the background singers and what they were doing um, was uh, was something that I, I, I had forgotten about and I, I really liked that I thought that the um, that the background vocalists were really you know brought a lot to this as well um, and it's you know I can't say 
I was trying to debate, like, thinking to myself, is this, like, overrated? Because it's a very highly rated album, right? When you're looking at, like, 46 of all time on Rolling Stone. <laughs> right. and like You know, like, it's the, it's the what is it, the 16th it, best album of the six, of the of the 80s, you know? So, I mean, part of me wants to say that, like, I while I do like this, I, I don't, I, it's, it's hard for me to put it up in that echelon. I think that that's a little bit too generous. Um, I, I give him props for doing something different, you know? I, and I kind of want to talk about this, like, controversy aside, because it's just trying to just focus on the music but i know it's hard it's, it is hard for a lot of people to do that with this record but um but i you know i i think there's something you know you can look at this in a couple of ways you know is this appropriation right so it's like taking you know taking something else that somebody else has done and, and then like putting making it like massively appealing to more of a white audience for your own personal gain yeah. um you, I guess you could make that argument. I also think, though, that at the same time, a lot of music is drawing on the influences that you have gotten in the past, regardless of who it's coming from, right? Regardless right. of what country it's from or what race it's from or, you know, what genre it is. If, you, if you're an artist and you're a musician and you're hearing something that's that's inspirational to you and you want to put your own spin on it and you want to include some of those people in on it, you know, this, this certainly isn't the first time that that was done and it's certainly not the last time. So, um you know, so I, I, I personally don't have an issue with it. Like if, if, if a Peter Gabriel or Paul Simon wants to take, you know, more of an African based, uh, you know, genre and, and kind of put their own spin on it, have at it. You know what I mean? You know, bring stuff like this to other people that might not have heard it, heard it before. And maybe that maybe will encourage people to delve into other stuff and, um, you know, explain, ex, expand their horizons. So, um, so I, I don't know. I, I know John's going to have some issues with this, but like, I, it does that stuff like that doesn't bother me necessarily. Um, and certainly I probably would say, I don't know, to me, I like the, the, the indestructible beats of Soweto probably better than this. I thought that that was, mm. it, it was just, it was more surprising, I think. But I also think that there's just, I have always like, you can call me Al. Like I, that, that is that that's love the horns in that. That is a, right. that is a fun song. Um, you know, and yes, that does remind me of, of, of the, Florida basketball games where that's, you know, the owl was the mascot, the alligator, right? So that's what they would play mm -hmm. at the, at some point during the basketball game. So that was always fun. I also like the video for that, the Chevy chase, you know, kind yeah. of like uh, lip syncing that that's, that, that always made me laugh, but um, you know, diamonds on the soldier shoes is great. Uh, Graceland's a really, really pretty song. Um, and so it's the more Zydeco upbeat kind of like Los Lobo stuff. I like that as well. So yeah, there's, I don't really have anything bad to say about this. I, I, I really liked it. I don't think at the same time, I don't think it's going to crack my top 20. You know, I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to hold it as highly in high as regard as other people do. But, um, but yeah, I mean, and it, and it makes sense that this was an album that really brought Simon's career back. You know, this was like yeah. his second wind, um, that, or maybe third wind really, because he did his solo career started off pretty, pretty successful, but then he kind of was going into obscurity and, you know, he was really depressed right before this. I mean, he had just have gotten divorced from uh you know carrie fisher and the, and his career was, wasn't going in a great direction this really revived him for a, at least a few more years and um you know so um so yeah I, I i'm thumbs up on it too it's a fun listen and um yeah i'm gonna go with that oh wait a couple other things i forgot postscript i was also wondering the heidi berg thing i was like so what happened to this i was looking into that like what happened to her mm -hmm. and i guess she never did a record and uh they said that after Paul Simon told her what he was going to do with his own record. Their relation, their professional relationship deteriorated. I guess she wasn't too oh. happy that she basically, he stole her ideas, essentially oh. what happened. So, okay. yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if I've ever thought more about what I was going to say on a review in the time we've been doing mm -hmm. this on this, because I, I look at this album as a, it's like a Rorschach test for me mm -hmm. as like a music listener. Um, and here's why, because musically, this album is undeniably excellent. Like it's, it's kind of a perfect mix of what like Paul Simon does well, like melody and songcraft, yeah. right? With a sound I definitively like, which is what we touched on in the indestructible beats of Soweto, percussion heavy, um, elements. Like all of these things are in my musical wheelhouse from a music perspective, sonically, right? Mm -hmm. And throughout this album, the quality of the music on this album is undeniable, right? It's like Western pop music, right? At a high level mixed with world, in this case, South African music, also 
taken and and well chosen the parts and the variety right of that yep. sound and instrumentation he's doing so there is no world when i cannot say from a musical standpoint like the the musicianship of this album songcraft of this album that this is not a good album um the the problem i've always had with this album is like i don't just listen to music divorced from context and the context of this album is like multi-layer problematic for me um you went into some of the apartheid stuff which i mean he is not the only offender of that so i am not going to indict him right i can even buy the idea right of you know i i didn't get paid for a concert right like these other people did i went because of the inspiration and how is that different than someone who you know, uh, you know, Paul McCartney found Fela Kuti, right? And people went to Jamaica and did these different, it's no different than kind of what I did when I did Mother and Child Reunion, right? I went to Jamaica and was inspired. Okay, I can, I can buy that a little bit, right? Um, I can also buy the idea that, um, you know, sometimes you listen to music and you're like, in order for this music to be heard, there needs to be sort of a Sherpa in terms of bringing it in and styles or, influence i mean i i spoke quite a bit on paul simon's self-titled right about how much i really appreciate it that he brought some of the reggae sounds right ska sounds a little bit mm -hmm. to it and and you know tinged it in but it was just a standalone track right but he sort of brought that in this thing can absolutely appreciate that i think what kind of at times makes this album offensive to me is that like it is definitively like a Paul Simon lyrical album and context album with like African beats layered over like Western ennui, right? Like, you know, there's stuff about like being at a cinematographer's party and, you know, like you could call me Al's like this like kind of, you know, tale of affluence getting old. It just, I think that's where this album loses me. Like it's kind, it feels very gimmicky, you know, in, in the sense of like, I'm going to do an album, but like, I'm going to be Paul Simon, but now with African beats behind it, because, hey, they sound cool. And listen to this thing I'm doing with the, uh, uh, like the, uh, Bayoyo boys. Right. But like in this song, I'm kind of writing about like this New York city relationship and my mental state, you know what I mean? And I, I, it loses me in that because that's where it becomes uh, cheap to me, I'd say a little bit. And the gimmick of it sort of shines through a little bit. And, um, you know, and then when you kind of hear that, a lot of these collaborators and people around are kind of saying like, Paul, you know, for a guy who's supposedly writing these like soul searching lyrics, you're kind of devoid of context here. You should be a little bit more self-aware and kind of like, it's like, yeah, I could be, or I could just do this. Right. And it's like, that's cool. But I always kind of don't like when people won't accept that choices they make, right. Come with larger context. And I think that that is where I struggle with this album a little bit in the sense that as a musical piece, I'm probably just as high on this guys as you are, but I don't listen to music divorced of context. Like when I listen to the sex pistols, I listen to the songs, but I also understand what the sex pistols were and what they represented. Right? Like when I listen to Nirvana, I listen to Nirvana, but I listen to them in the context of what, nirvana was you know when i listen to like run dmc right like we listened to earlier today i listen to them but also in their thing of hip-hop and and like it's you can't listen to this album right without like the and and i know you said i you were kind of surprised by this but like i was aware of all this right and and like i can hear it because you know like i said when you're writing a song about like up upscale new york living and you kind of have African beats behind it. I for some people they could go ingenious, whereas others like me here it is more like, ugh, you know what I mean? Like really, like you know, like it's one thing to do like under African skies, right, where you're staying authentic. It's another to write like, you know, peak, you know, middle age tales, you know, with somebody going like, oh, uh, you know, behind it and like beats, you know, it's kind of like <laughs> it defeats the purpose of 
kind of what this music was created for, you know? Mm. And I think that is why it is, it is nearly impossible for me to rank this album because I'd have to give it two rankings. I'd have to give the music ranking, which would be high, right? And then I'd have to give like the total context ranking, which is why oftentimes I use this as an example of like some of what I think are some of the worst tendencies of music. And, and I think you guys both know me. I'm not like overly woke, right? You know what I mean? So it's not like I'm coming, oh, like you can't delve into these other, co I think like that gatekeeping is just as bad as the gatekeeping of, you know, not bringing it in, right? But this one sort of, I think, it, you know, does walk that line a little bit in a way that I never felt like the talking heads did. Like there was like a, the use of it and the craft of it, right? And and even the spirit of the lyrics, like, and, and the, the whole construct, right? Like just, uh, and I think later that tour where he's hauling out the people to play with him, some yeah. people looked at it as like celebration, right? Whereas I, it just reinforced a little bit of the, um, when Paul Gimmicky Simon did that, you mean? Nature of Is it. Is that what yeah. you're talking about? Oh, yeah. Yes, he had a pretty infamous long tour where, I mean, he... It's the Rhythm of the like, Saints stuff. That's the next he, album. Yeah. Yep, yeah. And he wrote it beyond this album, and it kind of became, like like you said, you, you start to think... Like, I don't. I still think of Paul Simon primarily as, like, Simon and Garfunkel in early career, right? Like, and this is yeah. just his second phase, right? But, like, this for many people. And, and it inspired groups that... I have a love hate relationship with like you mentioned vampire weekend right and stuff and it's like you know upper middle class white people playing you know their you know narrative but with world beats behind it which is yeah uh, like a genre that I sometimes struggle with you know what I mean because there it does sometimes read a little bit um uh appropriating but that's uh, and i use that word loosely because i don't like to go or not i i use that word with reservations right because i don't like to go there but yeah th they're sort of my take yeah so i have i have some thoughts it seems like sure um it it would be just as i mean it would it wouldn't be it would be just as disingenuous if paul simon tried to write about something else like from the South African perspective or the struggle. Well, but, I mean, or... he does that on like under African skies and diamonds on the soles of her shoe. I mean, that's mm -hmm. homeless. These are songs where he is in that lane. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he is doing that on this album too. Yeah. But it just seems like your issue with this album, and you kind of said you didn't have as much of an issue with talking heads. And I guess we'll see what you think of Peter Gabriel, but it seems like your issue is more with Paul Simon or, and, or kind of like, upper middle class white musicians use, using this type of music? I think I, there's a line of when you're incorporating into your music and then there's a line of where it's becoming your shtick. Mm -hmm. And I think that between this and the next album and the tours and, you know, the sort of the, the idea of being a vanguard to these sounds when you literally have, you know, that album and I... I I always wonder why it's not just like, hey, I'm going to put my money behind releasing these guys in America mm -hmm. because they're incredible. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to release these guys and then I'm going to come on with them and play a song or do a song with them, but break them. You know what I mean? But yeah. that wasn't what happened here, right? It's like, I'm going to take the, it's kind of like what Los Lobos complained about. It's like, I'm going to take the best of what you do and I'm going to put myself in front of it. Mm -hmm. And you know, if it had been one album or a couple songs, right, which we saw before, it would be one thing. But, like, he, he wrote this another album, right, you know, and then a tour. and, and you That was Brazilian-influenced. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying. You know, yeah. I, like, there's an element, yeah. right, where it's kind of like you're like, well, he, I, I don't know. I, and I he was saying, like, I he basically – he talked a little bit about – I saw this in the research that I that I did that he was talking about, you know, the content of the lyrics and just – kind of just resting on his laurels and saying like, look, I, you know, I, I am, I write more lyrics about like relationships or in this case, like middle age, you know, because yeah. of like the, the stage that he was in his life. I mean, that's what you can call me Al is kind of about, I believe is, is like, you know, just trying to grapple yes. with like the middle age, you know, midlife crisis kind of a thing. And, um, and that was what, what his experience was. So, you know, it's, 
I mean, you know me, like context doesn't matter a whole lot. Like I'm not, I don't think that deeply about, you know, the, the music and it's, it's more about just my reaction to what I'm hearing, mostly musically. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's kind of, I mean, what would you say, like what type of lyricals, I mean, I don't think you're saying that Paul Simon in and of himself is a bad lyricist. It's just that the content is not matching up with like the music that you're hearing. And it seems like gimmicky or sticky, but like what type of like, what, like what type of lyrics or content I would, have preferred would you that he prefer? He did it as a song or two in the way that he did like mother and child reunion in his way of really falling in love with Jamaican music. And he's like, I'm going to do sort of a song in the spirit of a universal theme right with elements mm -hmm, yeah. of it but like i think when you make half of a paul simon album and you just happen to throw in south african songs and then you do traditional south african songs but you house them under your name uh, you know what i'm saying it's it's kind of like the yeah. worst of all worlds to me you know what it's i mean like a... it's gimmicky on your stuff and it's like you're That's kind it. of scooping up this talent and saying like instead of breaking it i'm gonna just incorporate it into my brand yeah hmm. it's like a it, you're having like a real cognitive dissonance some somewhat oh i am album. because like <laughs> musically i can't say anything but yeah. good things about this album because yeah, yeah. this is right up my alleyway sound that's why i'm not going to rate this album it's going to be the rare album i don't rate on our list you know because you know who loved this album who joe strummer <laughs> Joe well, Strummer I mean, has did a lot of this. You know what I mean? They incorporated stuff. So I, yeah, I he's totally got a, get it. Yep. He's got a quote talking about how like adolescents make the best records, except for Paul Simon, except Graceland. He's hit a new plateau there, but he's writing it to his own age group. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, um, yeah, yeah, John, that's an interesting perspective. It's never something I considered, and yeah, and uh, I'm not asking you guys to agree with it. But no, no, I, I know. Just, I'm, I'm just, just trying to explain when I've used this. You yeah. know what I, I'm saying. At when I've had my complex relationship with this album, I think when you guys heard me sort of sometimes roll my eyes at it, I think you thought my rolling of the eyes was like what it sounded like. And mm. my al my argument with this album, much like my laughing about Simon and Garfunkel, you know, uh, musically has very little to do with what they sound like lyrically. My jokes about early Simon and Garfunkel yeah. is like sort of like the, the type of, like audience they're playing for i laugh because i find some of the audience to be kind of funny and you yeah. know people i know who like like simon and garfunkel right like they'll describe scenes of when they really connect with the music and i'll be like that sounds like the worst possible way i'd want to spend a saturday but the other people are romanticizing it and it's like that's what's wonderful about life someone can hear this and say i can't think of a better way to spend a Saturday than this, right? And then I hear it and I'm like, I can't think of a way I would not want to be on like a Saturday than this. And that's but the, the beauty, right? But the yeah. the audiences for both Simon and Garfunkel and and Graceland are the same it's the same demographic. Correct. And it's the it's yeah. the baby boomers. Yeah. It's like yeah. and, you know, and that's it's, I, I get a similar feeling like when you talk about Springsteen, it's one of the things well, that well, let me, let's make a quick thing about that. White, white upper class baby boomers in particular <laughs> yeah. is yeah. who, right. like, this isn't yeah. like African American baby boomers are not picking up the Paul Simon album. You know what I mean? And I would argue rural baby boomers are not picking up Paul Simon albums. You know so what is mean? it fake? And that's okay. It's not that like everybody should have their music and it doesn't take away from how good it is. I'm just saying that like some of the same things that you could like, mm -hmm celebrate in that are some of the same things that sometimes can lend to a lack of self-awareness right and yeah. i would not call this a particularly self-aware album i would say and would you the narrative say, around it is not yeah. particularly so would you say like like as a general rule if something's got like that upper class white baby boom baby boomer sheen which like albums that speak to them or resonate with them or whatever mm -hmm. is going to inherently have some sort of negative Oh, not universal for you. Not universal. Okay. Like I, I don't. But like I, I think if you are uh, like Steely Dan doesn't offend me, you know. And Steely Dan mm -hmm. is playing that lane quite a bit, right? Like I mean, Steely Dan's whole vibe, right, is that you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. But but Steely Dan unabashedly plays in that lane. You know what I mean? Like they don't. Yep try to pretend they don't do like a punk album like that's what i joked about billy joel a lot right because like he he kind of wanted to play in that lane too but he was like how come nobody treats me like i'm hard or aggressive <laughs> you know it's like dude you're billy joel you know what i mean like you sell a shit ton of records because you you have this large affluent group of people that do it and that's cool but like part of doing that right is like in being billy joel you're not fucking the sex pistols you know what i mean you're not like and yeah. like 
that's the thing. Like, and like, it kind of to me, it's like, you know, when when you do like an album in apartheid South Africa, and certain people look at you and go, "That might be a bad look, huh?" And you go, "I j- I'm just following the music, man." Like, there's like a certain yeah. level of like you get to walk away right from that, and you didn't even like take well, the time yeah. to uplift, right? Well, you instead certain... were like. I like this, so I'm gonna do it. But it's gonna be, of course, we have to call it Paul Simon Grace. We can't, you know, we can't call it Volume Two of the Beats of the th- like. Ooh, yeah. Let's be like, and like that's a little bit of. Does that well, make sense? A, a little bit of mm-hmm. why it's a it's, certain, there's a little. It's a certain yeah. uh, amount of. I mean, it is white privilege to be able to do that and kind of like knowingly not care. <laughs> and I don't do want to go down that road, but yes, I mean, when you kind of say a little bit of what that is, you know what I mean? It's kind of like the ability to hand wave that. And even yeah. just like, oh, I, I really learned something when I went there that these people were on a curfew and they seemed really nervous. It's like, you don't say, you know what I mean? Cause you know, you know, you might, <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know. Like to me, it's kind of like, if you want to celebrate it, right. You know, like, it's kind of like, if you want to celebrate reggae you kind of you release bob marley's album you don't do mm. john yeah, lennon I, sings paul I, I like that's a good comparative point right like think of someone like john lennon right matt mm-hmm. would he ever have been this non-self-aware i can't see john lennon doing something like this you know what i'm saying like could you see him liking south african music right sure definitively yes right I mean, yeah, can you see him saying like, i'm now going to do an album that does south african things and I'm, but you couldn't right because like there's a level of like the I, lens right that he'd have to do it through. but then it's like could you see paul mccartney doing it you sure can right and yeah. like what's the difference sometimes between john lennon and paul mccartney a little bit of self-awareness right you know a little bit you know and so like that's kind of what i'm getting at you know mm-hmm. and that's and and I like I, I don't want to kind of go down that lane because I don't want people to like think that that's my lane right like like but like that I I've always struggled a little bit with that and I I'm hesitant to kind of own that because I don't think that like musicians have to be perfect or there's you always have to be authentically great because I don't believe that you know what I mean I just think that like when you're veering out of lanes right you kind of got to know and be aware that you're out of that lane and all that entails it's like you know if you're a musician and you do your country album right like look at how much the birds right went out of their way to try to be authentically country when they went to Nashville and they still got shit all over right but they like did all the right things right they tried to like follow the things and be aware of it. And even when they got shit over by the thing, they go like, I get it. Right. Because you know, like we are entering there and we were well aware that we were going to do it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Kind of with sweet. Yeah. And I think, well, Paul Simon, I think he probably, I mean, some of the quotes that he was giving was basically talking about him. He's aware, obviously of the criticism that he got, but he was looking at it from his perspective of being more like, Hey, I am bringing people together. I am celebrating this. I, you know, I'm paying them well. You know, I'm not, you know, I, yeah. I'm giving them. So- he gave them songwriting credits where he felt like it was appropriate. Um, you know, so in his yeah, but mind, he's always was- in control. Like he, he's the one paying them. He's giving them the songwriting sure. credits. He's deciding like yes. that this needs to be brought in by him. Like, mm-hmm. I, I, and maybe it's just maybe it's I don't know. It's rationalization or whatever you know. But like, but yeah, I mean, I, I mean, look, he's. He certainly, you know, like a lot of artists are, I mean, he's no different uh, and maybe he's even a little bit more so, but definitely, you know, egocentric, you know, and that's one of the big reasons he and Garfunkel didn't get along was and he always had something to prove. I was reminded of that when going through the research, you know, like the, one of the initial things that was off putting for, for about Garfunkel for hit for Simon was like, man, he's tall and he's good looking and he's charismatic and like all this. And I'm none of those things. And I write all these amazing songs and he's writing on my coattails. And he's mm-hmm. he certainly had a chip on his shoulder about that and, and used that as much as he could to either, sure. you know, either make more money yeah, or with the songwriting the credits or whatever the partnership which was a big piece of what simon yeah. and garfunkel was like it was yeah. absolutely his songs but yeah like, let's be honest art garfunkel's got the better voice and paul simon's got a good voice but like art garfunkel's yeah. voice was his yeah. ticket, right like it so i i i don't want to go down that road too much I, but i'm gonna abstain from it. and i knew i didn't want to drag that talk into the middle of our review because i wanted the review to get a full sounding out you know what i yeah. mean from you guys and i also don't want it to sound like my take is this deep profound thing because it's not anymore it's just a different angle from it and i just wanted to try to explain where my complicated feelings for this album come well from. and it just and it highlights again like how i think you know we can listen to music differently you know like it's just I, i'm still 
I don't know if I've ever talked to anybody, at least certainly not in depth, like, like we have here about, you know, the, the, the emphasis that you place on like the context and placing the, 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 within the time and the, and what's happening around it and the, you know, the storyline and all that stuff. It's just like, it's such, to me, it's kind of like a foreign way of looking at it. And, um, because it's, for me, it's mostly like the lyrics I get, like, oh, I really love the lyrics. I hear that all the time. But I think that's from my perspective, I don't hear people talk about that a lot. And I think sometimes I still have trouble wrapping my head around like how, how much of a significant role that can play for people people and clearly it does for you and i'm not saying like oh you're wrong or anything like that it's just it's really it's been an interesting kind of thing to see play out here because it's just so different for, and i and i understand what you're saying like when you explain it i'm like okay it makes sense but like it's such a far thing removed from my brain when i just listen to music particularly for like the first time I'm like it's just mine is a much more of like reaction in the moment like how is how do what do i think about the melody here what do i think about the the beats or whatever you know the sound of the guy's voice on top of the what they're doing um so uh but no you i mean you're certainly um consistent with that i mean that's a lot of your reviews are always brought into context and history and stuff like that where i feel like mine are more and josh is to an extent or well it's more like what's this song or what's this you know album doing for me in that it's moment important to have all those takes because we wouldn't want all three of us to give the same yeah. well sure i think that's a little bit of what the key what? is we we come yeah yeah I, and i would say too I, I think this is my final thought but this this situation or this album and kind of the context around it to me seems a bit more like morally murky than something where like an artist like Roman Polanski uh you know has had you know accusations and not just accusations but has had sex with underage girls at one point or another and you know cannot come back to the U.S. as a result and that kind of like seems clear on how you should feel about it and like how that could influence your view of of um I, I do want to share artist. one thing though. My my criticism of this is is not as moralistic as I think you guys may be. Like I don't think Paul Simon is an amoral person or that even what he did here was amoral, right? Like or like I'm not judging him kind of from that thing. I think it's more for me, like when I look at the context, right? I, I kind of hate the idea that when I hear these African sounds, like the first thing I thought before we did it is, oh, this sounds like the Paul Simon album. And it's like, it shouldn't, you know what I mean? It should sound like huh. the mm -hmm. indestructible beats of Soweto and yeah, the fact yeah. that it didn't. And we had to like dig through a Rolling Stone article 30 years later to go, oh shit, this is what he listened to to get it. Like that's, that's a little like, and, and for me, it's about putting yeah. stuff in its place and its context. And I think there's a part of me that always favors the underdog. So like you kind of were going, Matt, like the idea of like, are you offended by the upper middle class sensibility? I'm not offended by it there, but I'm always searching to some degree, right? And it's an easier lane for me to, to come but, from an underdog sensibility. But is that's it why genres like punk and hip hop and stuff, I think are relatively easy for me to understand to some degree because especially the early like versions of it right you know what i mean they're basically underdog genres right but isn't that like what what rock and roll came from like who how many people know robert johnson yeah. sure right you know robert johnson i mean the rolling stones people know the rolling stones but then that's Absolutely. and that's who keith richards was really yeah. uh, robert johnson <laughs> it's like these artists that that made nothing that never got really notoriety or well, sold big contracts honest, or whatever El Elvis's Elvis, new yes. esteem is a context like exactly the one I just had, right? Like right. people are talking about, is Hound Dog a good song, right? Like how we're talking and we perceive Elvis now is this discussion. Is that fair yeah. or should we look at it like, yeah, you can make an argument one way or the other, but like you really, these days you can't have an Elvis discussion without yep. basically having the discussion I just had about Paul Simon. Yep. And it doesn't just have to be race, by the way, either. It could be like Josh said, complicated sex like how would we talk about r kelly right yeah. like if we did jerry lee lewis like would that be problematic right. you know what i mean like what they so from that into things then there's other things right like you know the the early hit writers you know what i mean that stole money from all but of even the, the performers and but even if you're having them. even if you're having those conversations with elvis i mean like if you go to somebody on the street like most random person on the street, a lot of people are going to know Elvis or going to know an Elvis song or be, you know, like a lot of people won't know Muddy Waters. Like, who's yeah. that? Like, what's a Muddy Waters song? What's a rock? I, can, I, I can't even tell you, right? I know Muddy right. Waters. No, I, I can't I name you what, a Muddy Waters song. I and, know what you're saying. Yeah. But like what I'm saying is that 
like you're sort of saying I'm surprised John that you hear it this way and I get what you're saying but like it isn't as in like even in mainstream evaluations of stuff like we, we do this you know what I mean like you might not you know what I mean but like these days the discussion of what Elvis is pretty much supersedes Elvis's music which I, you know I don't even know if that's fair right but like that's what Elvis means to this yeah. last 10 years of right. people yeah you know what I'm saying and and like he and that's a little bit of you know when you say like how does it come in it's like well some of my extension is some of what that is for people like how well, do and, I appreciate Elvis like as well it's not even both, just Elvis yeah. I would throw in like I would throw in the Rolling Stones with that too I mean they covered like some of those songs sure. as well and you know um and that's I think that that's an unfortunate thing that you just that you're but you're going to have artists that take something that somebody did that was an underground thing that nobody ever heard of and they brought it to this mainstream and then by proxy those artists then become known at least in name by by some maybe you know but uh, the Stones you know, would bring Stones would trip over themselves right so did Elvis to some degree to make mm -hmm. sure that you understood that they were definitively playing black music yeah they would do what they could to elevate. Yep artists right you know what i mean and they also spent a lot of money to like elvis spent a lot of money to make sure that you knew who chuck berry and his contemporaries were right like he kind of put some of his you know heft behind that i'm not saying yeah. that paul simon didn't do that you know what i mean but like there's there's to some degree a little bit of a responsibility of like okay do you present it as your own or do you present it yeah. as you know even going beyond just what could be like a racial thing like Nirvana used to go out of their way, right? Kurt Cobain to say, you know, we sound a lot like the Pixies because we stole a lot of our shit. Like he always, right? You know what I mean? Like go out of his way to make sure like, yes, I'm very well aware that our loud, soft sound, right? Owes a huge debt to the Pixies who were bigger then, but make no mistake about it. We are like, you know what I'm saying? Like there's, mm -hmm. and there's like that lean, right? You know what I mean? Like what represents the right amount of um, credit. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. and stuff. So anyway, yep. it's you know, no, and the apartheid thing's its own thing because it it like I said, the closest I could think of is that sports washing thing. Like, yeah. some people will be like, everybody's bad, you know what I mean? Or everybody does it. But you know, you know what the else question... it's kind of like is like the yeah. Israel Palestine thing. Yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> people's thoughts on that, or or yep. you know, the history around that too. I think, but yeah, that's no, I I think it's really interesting, John. I I, I wouldn't enjoy the conversation about this. Yeah. It's so, but yeah, crazily enough, strongly recommend for the music. It, it like, I do want to stress that enough. I'm right with you guys in terms of what it sounds like. And if the, the larger baggage doesn't matter to you, I in no way judge you. And I would say rush to pick this up because it is a really remarkably good musical album. But if like that context is important to you or, or knowing it, yeah, I mean, you're going to take pause a little bit yeah. with mm. this. So just be, you know, be aware of like what your late you know your style of music is and you know come at it and then make your own decision and your decision is not wrong it's yours but yeah i'm always a fan of more uh nuance than less nuance for me personally mm. yep. yeah oh, oh, wow okay so um Real quick here. Actually, I did find out the uh, the other song that he was alleged to plagiarize was That Was Your Mother. Um, and the, I guess that was uh, the band, the Zydeco band, Good Rockin' Dopesy and the Twisters. Uh, and they felt that he derived that song from their song, My Baby, She's Gone. I did listen to both. And I see what they're saying. There, you know, there is some similarity there. So, uh, so yeah. But as I said, Paul Simon. After this, he did release "Rhythm of the Saints" in 1990. That was inspired by Brazilian music. This time, uh, that's when they also had the second park and uh, a second concert in Central Park. Uh, he also appeared on MTV's Unplugged. And after that, he kind of. His, his appearance on the pop culture scene kind of dropped fairly dramatically. Um, he did continue to work here and there with Art Garfunkel. I actually, I think I saw them in 04 when they reunited. Um, so they kind of, they, they still re got back together for some shows there. Um, on February 5th, 2018, he announced his retirement from touring, playing his final show on September 22nd, 2018 in Queens. Uh, but that was short-lived because he actually played one more show in August of 2019 in San Francisco, donating the proceeds from that show in Golden Gate Park to a variety of uh, various charities. He has a total of 14 solo albums, which uh, the most recent was 2018's In the Blue Light. 
And on March 31st, 2021, he sold his music publishing catalog to Sony. This is like the new thing to do. Like Dylan yeah. did this. Bieber and, just uh, did it. Bieber did it. I think Neil Young sold part of his as well. Um, and uh, so Paul Simon made a cool $250 million off of that uh, that sale. He better start getting his estate in order. He needs <laughs> taxed on that. <laughs> uh, and he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, actually first time in 1990 with Garfunkel as Simon and Garfunkel, and for a second time in 2001 as a solo artist.